G'day guys, Christian Murray here, publisher of the Queen's Post. Today I'm going to be talking to Linda Lee. She's a candidate for the 23rd Council District that represents neighbourhoods in Eastern Queens. Hey Linda, thank you very much for joining me today. Oh no, thank you so much for having me. Great, well it's really good to see you. So for many people out there, you know, they know you because you've done a lot of community work, you're very engaged in the community, but for those that don't, can you just sort of tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, you know, where you live, et cetera, and why you're running? Sure. So um, again, my name is Linda. I actually live in Oakland Gardens, uh, right here in the district, and uh, mom of two young boys that are seven and two. So as a parent, if there's parents out there, um, you know, kudos to all of us that have uh, survived the past year and a half. It's been tough. Um, and I also run a nonprofit organization. So I am the president and CEO of KCS Korean Community Services. Um, and I've been there for about 12, almost 12 years now. And we have six locations across the city and we provide services, um, we have, which include uh, two senior centers, the only Meals on Wheels program that serves the Asian community right here in Queens. Um, as well as uh, we're the only state licensed mental health clinic that the, the only um, state licensed mental health clinic that's run and operated by a Korean nonprofit organization. And that's something that took me about four years, um, but it was very important for me to provide that service for the community uh, in language and in a very culturally sensitive way, because uh, there were not that many uh, mental health um, services in our community. Mm. And uh, yeah, and we also have a whole host of public health programs. And so we've been quite busy during the pandemic with, um, you know, just, <laughs> you know, the COVID testing, you know, when it wasn't readily available to the community. And we recently, if, well, a few months ago, I should say, we became a vaccine site. Wow. And so that's been running very smoothly as well. And, you know, we serve daily about 1,500 clients, I would say even more so probably since the pandemic started. Um, and we've been operating uh, since 1973. So we've been around for 48 years, our nonprofit organization. Before that, I was doing, you know, um, policy work at the New York State Health Foundation, uh, you know, in New York State, and also providing grants to a lot of healthcare organizations and nonprofits across the state. And in general, um, you know, it's interesting because I never thought I wanted to be in this field. I, I actually was in college, majoring in economics, thinking I was going to go into, you um, finance and be an investment banker, you know, and I went to Barnard College and, and, you know, was totally planning on doing that. And then the summer before my senior year of college, I actually uh, took a job as a camp counselor. And that totally changed the trajectory of my life because it was for inner city kids. And it really, at that point, like, I, I know I want to help people. I just don't know how. Um, and that's all I knew at that point. And so went overseas, taught English came back, worked in a nonprofit, and then decided to go to social work school um, at Columbia for uh, my master's degree. And that's really where um, I really started this whole, um, you know, furthered my whole love for serving the community. So it's been quite a journey. Yeah, yeah you've certainly done a lot of different things. Were you born in Queens to, you know, parents that were immigrants? What's sort of your background? Sure. Um, so yeah, my, my father came as a graduate student actually back in 1973. So mm -hmm. he was, he went to Ohio State University mm -hmm. to get his master's in engineering. So he, to this day, never misses a football game, college football, oh, wow. <laughs> like a diehard mm -hmm. Ohio State fan. And then after that, my parents actually moved to um, New York State. I was actually born in Elmira, New York, which is upstate by the Finger Lake region. Oh, There's yeah. Yeah, there's not a lot of diversity in that part of New York State. And so I learned at a very young age what it felt like to be different mm -hmm. and an outsider. So, um, but after that, moved to Long Island, spent uh, middle school, high school there. And then, yeah, I've been in Queens for the last 12, 13, 13 years or so. <laughs> but I grew up in Queens a lot because my church is in Queens. Uh, so I went to a church right here. So a lot of my friends went to Cardozo, Bayside High School, Francis Lewis. And so I spent a lot of time in this part of the district. Right. Now, you're on the local community board, right? And, yes. and And you're also involved in, you know, PTA stuff as well, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, so my mantra is, uh, I, I feel like in order to really learn and understand something, I really have to get my hands dirty and 
be part of it, right? So that's why um, even when I was working at New York State Health Foundation, I was like, well, what are exactly the challenges and barriers on the ground? And so that's mm -hmm. why I joined the Direct Social Service Agency. And um, for the community board, I was like, well, I really want to understand how things work on a very, very local level in the community, which is why I joined about eight years ago. And similarly, you know, my son is in first grade right now at PS203 and um, I felt like, okay, I want to understand what the challenges are for the schools. You know, how can we help support the administrators, principals, and as well as the parents. And so that's why I joined the school leadership team last year. So it's mm. been an amazing learning experience, I have to say, um, especially during the pandemic and during COVID where, you know, hybrid learning, remote learning, you know, what's going on with the schools? Are they opening? Are they closing? It's been such a ride for all of the school administrators and I have to give so much kudos to everyone who is a teacher as well as a school administrator because it has been easy the past year and a half where they literally have had to pivot within 12 hours right mm -hmm. like they have a whole that they've worked out then they have to scrap it because the you know mayor and you know DOE has said oh just kidding we're not going to open we're going to do this <laughs> so um, you know, it's been quite the journey as well for working parents like myself as well. Yeah, yeah, no. You have <laughs> school children and your whole perspective on life changes, it turns upside down and yeah. back to front. So, um, Definitely, yes. Mm. So look, uh, getting on to sort of more local issues, um, transportation, it's a big issue, I guess, it all over New York City, but here in District 23, some say it's a transit desert. Some say the roads are in a horrible state of disrepair. What are your thoughts on uh, the district in terms of transportation? Sure. Um, so transportation, like you mentioned, uh, it is known as a transit desert here. And it's, it's you know, a lot of folks who, even, even I have to say, just as an example, when I have meetings out here or if we have canvassers that come out here that don't have cars and they have to rely on public transportation to get out here, mm. I think that's people really feel and understand, okay, wow, this is like, because their question is, which subway do I take? And I'm like, well, there's no subway. You can take uh, the seven train or the E train or somewhere else and then take buses to get here. Um, and we're perfectly situated right in between two Long Island Railroad lines, right? Yeah. So we have the Port Washington line above us. And I think it's the Hempstead as well as the Huntington line below us. And so um, it's, it's, you know, it really is like perfectly situated in between. So we rely heavily on buses uh, to get around, especially with students, um, you know, between schools and their after school activities, as well as, um, you know, cars in this district, you know, a lot of folks drive because they need to either commute to a local major hub uh, yeah. transportation or they just commute into work because of, um, you know, they run small businesses or they have something else that they do. So. Um, it's, it's almost like this planes, trains, buses, boats kind of situation. Like we, we you know, it's, it's how do we figure out the best solution for everyone? And I think obviously we want to um, keep the environment safe as well, right? So then the question becomes, how do we get the buses working in such a way where um, it makes sense to get people where they need to get in an efficient way? Um, mm. So for example, I know some of the conversations in where do we put express bus lines potentially along some of the major east-west routes? Um, but also what we've been hearing from residents as we door knock is, you know, what are some of the north-south bus routes also that make sense? Because there aren't a lot of those that go from the far like northeast corner where it's the little neck Douglaston area, taking them to major transportation hubs. And so the bus routes are very you know, uh, zigzaggy and don't necessarily make the most sense. So those are all things, I, you know, right before COVID happened, the MTA was doing a whole bus redesign. They were in the middle of getting input from the community and then COVID mm. happened. And so I think we pick up, pick up that conversation as possible. And our community center, um, although it's not in the district, it impacts a lot of the residents who live in our district. And so our community center held, uh, was one of the locations where they held the meeting for the bus redesign. And I have to say, I was actually shocked at how packed that ballroom was because our ballroom can fit at least 300 people, three, 400 people. And it was packed and there were people even pouring out into the lobby waiting room area. So this is a big issue for the district. It's something mm. that people are very concerned about um, and that they're very invested in. So I think we need to make sense of where to put 
potential express lanes, but also think about how that could impact small businesses when it comes to parking, right? Because a lot of them do are on those major streets. Mm -hmm. And then also, I know that folks have been talking about bike lanes. And so where do the bike lanes go where it makes sense, where it's uh, both safe for the drivers as well as the bikers? Um, and also for older adults, you know, a lot of old, we have one of the highest percentages of older adults mm -hmm. in this district. And so then the question becomes, what's the safest way for them to get around, right? Um, so they can drive, but for those that don't drive or cannot drive, you know, what are the transportation alternatives for them as well? So I spoke to a few voters that actually don't have cars. And so they were talking about their elderly parents and there's no bus stop that's near them that they can easily walk to because they're still mobile, mm. but it's, you know, it's, it's a long distance for them to walk to the bus stop. So these are all concerns that I think folks struggle with because it is a very residential district and part of uh, the city. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're bordering right on Long Island and that, that feel of, you know, a very residential neighborhood with one, two family homes, lots of garden co-ops. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, how do we figure that out? And so those are conversations I think we definitely need to continue as soon as possible, especially with the bus redesign. Yeah. Were you happy with the direction the bus redesign was going in terms of what they suggested? I mean, there were other parts mm. of Queens where they were not happy with what was suggested. Yeah, I, I think I think the general feedback is that it, it, it definitely needed a lot more input from the community from the get-go. And I think the problem has always been that usually the community input is involved later on in the process mm. and not on. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, having been on the community board, that's a lot of the frustration also that folks felt is that, you know, why was this not brought to the community beforehand? Because there are a lot of civic associations, community boards, uh, nonprofit organizations that have reached into the community where we could have asked um, some of our community members, hey, what do you think about this design? Does it make sense? Yeah. Um, so where are the opportunities where we could get that feedback later, I think would be beneficial. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention also is that for the Long Island Railroad, another conversation I think with the MTA that's been happening or has taken place is the single fare uh, ride where, you know, because right now Eastern Queens is zoned differently than Western Queens. And so the folks out here actually pay more for their Long Island Railroad ticket. So right. if we had a single fare system in residence for New York City, um, maybe that would also encourage folks to take the train and not drive as much um, and also, you know, look at alternative solutions. So. That makes sense, yeah. Okay. Um, the last, you know, year and a half, um, you know, I guess particularly the last year, uh, the NYPD, the funding for the NYPD, and then of course you've had issues regarding police brutality and of course uh, the killing of George Floyd, Minneapolis. Um, what is your view on the NYPD? Do you think it should its funding should be cut? What would you do as a council member? Um, I think there definitely needs to be reforms. I think there needs to be more accountability. However, I'm not in favor of this whole uh, blanket of defunding the police because I think we really need to look at what that means mm. and what is getting caught. And I guess what I mean by that is um, two examples that impact this district are um, the 105th, 116th precinct. Uh, that was cut from the budget. And, and for those that don't know the geographic area of Eastern Queens, the 105th precinct is supposed to cover everything from the northern part of the district all the way past our district down to JFK. Yeah. It's a large, it's a very large geographic area that this precinct covers. And I believe it's actually the largest geographic uh, uh, imprint of like any precinct in New York City, actually. So they cover a lot of ground. And so when there's an issue or uh, a call to 911 that goes in, sometimes it can take unnecessarily long periods of time for them to respond to an emergency. And so the community had planned for 40 years to create another precinct, which was supposed to be the 116th precinct that would um, not necessarily do, it's, it's, I, I think people may be misconstrued as over-policing, but it's simply, to lessen the burden of having one precinct cover that whole ground. Yeah. So um, that was taken out of the budget after many, many years of the community advocating for that. So I think that was a negative impact on our community. So, it, you know, thankfully the mayor did put that back in. And I do That's think right. that that is something we need to make sure stays in the budget. Hmm. Um, 
And, you know, it's supposed to be tied with community services as well, which I think is great because you need to have something that's comprehensive. Um, the other thing I think that negatively impacted our community is that the Asian Hate Crimes Task Force was supposed to be included in that budget as well, but that was one of the things that was taken out. And especially in a time where we've seen such an uptick in hate crimes in the Asian community, as well as the Jewish community, other community, like all, we've seen such an uptick in hate crimes that are happening. And, you yeah. know, when I spoke to the um, deputy inspector uh, Lou at the time, he has since stepped down and it's deputy inspector Ang that is taking over that. But when we had a conversation with them, you could hear it in his voice. He's like, you know, we're doing this pro bono. We're doing this on our free time because it's our community too, right? And these, these investigating these crimes that are happening throughout the city is important to us. We want to make sure that our community feels safe, right? And so um, they were doing it on their own time with no resources. And so that is something I think that has negatively impacted our communities because they should be able to have um, the resources available to them to look into some of these hate crimes that are happening across the city. Um, so in that sense, you know, I don't think that we need to, those are some of the things that hurt and were included in the cut. Mm. But things I do support is that, you know, I think there needs to be accountability, right? So if there are bad apples in the bunch, I think we need to make sure that we're holding them accountable and that they're, that the whole entirety of the NYP is not getting a bad name because of those officers that are not complying. And, um, and I think part of that also, part of the issue in helping could be in the hiring process, because I do think that with um, the hiring, it would be great to make an effort to hire more folks. And I have seen an increase in this actually, um, to hire officers that speak the languages and reflect the communities that they're, that they're um, involved in, right? So making sure, cause that does help people in the community feel more comfortable to actually report things as well as um, go to an NYPD officer if they feel that there's something happening. Mm -hmm. And so if they speak the languages and look and reflect the communities that they serve, I think that does help. And I think also trainings are something that definitely need to happen more often because, you know, as a, as a social worker myself and as teachers and other professionals like attorneys out there, you know, there's always constant training. There's continuing, edu continuing education credits that we have to go through. So mm. I think that ongoing training should be part of what's included as um, you know, just the general um, process of the NYPD. I think that should be something that we that we um, really advocate for because, you know, the the training that they go through at the beginning of their academy. I mean, I don't think it's enough. I think you're constantly going to have to deal with new issues coming up, right? So that's something I think that should be included. And finally, I know that when it comes to mental health, you know, I run a mental health clinic. I have social workers on staff, and. I think when you're talking about nonviolent situations, like I, I was talking to a colleague that runs a homeless shelter in New York City, right? And already NYPD are not present there, right? So we have Department of Homeless Services that have their own security team that are, that are staffing the homeless shelters. And I don't think that's necessarily a place where we need to pour our resources into, you know, having NYPD officers unnecessarily there. I don't think that's necessary. Um, however, when you're talking about responding to, let's just say, a domestic violence call or, or someone who is off their medication that is acting violently, those are situations where I think it needs to be a hybrid solution, right? Mm -hmm. You know, or either maybe embedding uh, mental health professionals into the NYPD or having a special training for the officers or partnering with different groups in the community that have access to social workers and mental health professionals and, and having a joint response team. I think that's something that we, we do need because I don't necessarily know if it makes sense to put a social worker in a dangerous situation where they have no backup or expertise in terms of public safety. But I also don't know if it makes sense for someone from public safety without a mental health background to be in there by themselves either. So I do think we need to look at it from a more holistic perspective. Yeah, no, fair enough. Now the 105 precinct, Linda, uh, what, what have I seen in terms of shootings? I haven't seen the latest numbers, but has there been an uptick in shootings out here and what can be done about shootings? I mean, it's a problem citywide, of course, but have you sort of looked at shooting issues and what would you do to try and get on top of that? Um, I actually haven't seen, uh, let's see, I was attending a civic association meeting recently where, you know, cause Igor, who is the captain over at the 105th definitely goes through those numbers oh. um, for the meetings, but 
Um, I'm not regularly part of those, so I don't know the latest numbers. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. That was not mine. No, no, it's totally fine. It's totally fine. But, you know, that's a good question. But I, I personally don't know what the latest numbers are or what the trend is. I mean, I'd be interested to see that myself. Mm. Um, in general, across the city, I think, again, I think it comes back to the continuous training in my, in my perspective. I think we need to constantly train officers. You know, how's the best way, you know, what is the best way to respond? You know, because we've seen... Um, incidences and articles where, you know, they, there was an officer that mistook their gun for something else. And it's like things like that, you know, if, if, if we continue the training, uh, it's, you know, the hope is that those things will not happen. Um, but I do think that we need to help them feel comfortable to understand and know how to respond to different situations. Okay. Fair Community boards. I want to talk to you about those for a moment. Um, obviously the city council member, dominates half of them in, in the district in which they serve. Um, what do you think about the process in which people are selected to the board? I mean, you would have, I guess, the say over half of the new members each year. Um, what, would you change that process or do you think it works right now? Um, I think one of the things that um, the current Queensborough President Donovan Richards did this year differently, which I thought was great, was he simply um, added an online application process, mm -hmm. which I think actually opens the doors and gives a lot more access to folks in the community to apply. Um, because the I believe previously they had us, you know, write down responses on paper and then mail it in, which for some folks is not... Um, as easy to do and you know given how busy people are you know not that it's an mm. but i just think it's it's like simply making that switch to an online application it it actually increased the pool of applicants by quite a bit mm. i think here they had actually one of the highest response rates of applications for the community board um in than in the past ever um so i think just simply switching um the access and how in which how people can apply actually made a big difference, which I'm, you know, I think it's it's great to have as many different options as possible. Like for folks that feel comfortable sending it in by mail, let them do that. Mm. Um, folks that want to do it online, let them do it that way. So I think either way, you know, increasing that is great. Um, you know, and and also of course reaching out to different community groups that are already doing the work on the ground, getting their recommendations, their opinions, I think is always good. Reaching out to different communities in the district um, is always good and it, I think it's great when it's reflective of the folks that actually live there. What do you think though, I mean theoretically you as a council member or any council member could say I don't like that Murray guy, that Murray guy's a pain, I don't like him, I don't want him on the board even though he could be the greatest thing that ever walked the earth. So how do you stop that, you know, the bias that could potentially be there? Like I've heard some people say well a Republican could never get on a community board because there's a Democrat in charge of the city council district. How do you sort of, um, you know, keep the whole thing at arm's length so sort of anyone with, I mean, obviously you don't want crazies getting on the board, but how do you sort of give, every, you know, everyone a fair shot, so to speak? Yeah. Um, I think, um, like I mentioned before, just making sure that your tentacles are everywhere, right? Because mm. the way I see things is that, um, I may not agree with you on everything, but I think that could actually make things better and stronger, right? Because right. I don't necessarily want everyone who thinks like me because that's not gonna make the strongest community board in my opinion. Um, I think, uh, you know, how you conduct yourself and whether you're professional or inappropriate is a separate issue, right? Like those things that do need to be addressed, right? Um, but in terms of, of where people lie, in terms of their beliefs or policies, I think it's good to have a range, hmm. right? Because from that broad range, you can say, okay, you know, let's, we're all adults here. Let's, let's discuss this. We may not agree on everything, but what's the sort of compromise or comfortable position that maybe not everyone can win at, but at least everyone feels comfortable with the end result decision. I think for me, that would be my approach is how do we get the small business voice, as well as the community voice, as well as the religious leader voice, and, you know, um, yeah. folks with different interests all, you know, to agree. So I think we have to look in, in different areas. <laughs> well, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
what do you think in terms of, you know, you're a community board member, so what do you think in terms of the say that the board gets on, say, land use issues? Obviously, they're just an advisory opinion. Do you think that they should have more teeth, or do you think it works the way it is now? Um, I think it'd be great if we had more teeth, to be honest, because um, one of the things that I know being part of the board that people feel frustrated about is, you know, ideally speaking, if the community board is made up of members that reflect the neighborhoods, right? And they're saying, listen, our residents and our neighbors have an issue with this because of X, Y, Z. I do think that those things should be taken more seriously and, and should be at least part of the decision-making process that the city goes through, right? I'm not saying that necessarily we should hold all the weight, but I do think it should be part of that formula yeah. that goes into the end result factor. Um, so to me, I think it, that, that it would make more sense for us to have teeth on that. Because mm. really, at the moment, it's the council person that right, pretty much decides where the project land use or rezoning, it's a council member almost alone that decides whether something happens or not um, because of member deference. Do you, do you agree with that? Whereby the, so much power is vested in the one council member of the district where a zoning is proposed? Because I mean, if you liked a particular, well, guess, if you liked a rezoning yeah. in this area, the community board said, nah, borough president said, nah, city planning, to, commission said oh yeah okay and then old linda lee comes along and says yeah go for it do you think uh, and the board and the council would go along with you because of member difference do you think that is a system that works um it works if you have the right person in office i think okay. right so i you know i mean so here's the thing if 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 i were elected and i actually get to um a place where a development project comes into the district and you know we have to decide on it. My first thing is to go to the community board and the community to say, what do you guys think about this, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that ideally be the process is, you know, how what what is in the best interest of the community? Because if I'm elected and I'm beholden to the interests of the residents and the folks in my district, right? I do think that um, I have to also do my due diligence and maybe that could be part of the process is to make sure that the council member you know, does a certain um, due diligence of the process in the district, right? Yeah. Um, I, I do think that's important, right? We need to reflect, make sure that the council member is reflecting the interests of people that they serve and not others, right? So so that I think is important. I don't know, um, I, I don't know if that necessarily means, because I think there's also a con to, at the same time, taking that away from the council member as well, right? So there's pros and cons to both sides, but, um, again, this is more in an ideal world, but if, if the mm. council is, is really truly trying to make the do right by the community, then I think it works. But, um, you know, and conversely so, right, if there's a project that comes up and the, the council member is in fact reflecting the voice of the community, but there's another process that railroads their decision, I don't know if that necessarily is right either, right? So. Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, a council member in Staten Island isn't going to know what's happening down the road here that you do. So I, I, I get right. That. Yeah. Right. So I, I do think, again, there should be some weight given to the council member because they know their district the best, supposedly, right? Or they mm. should know their district the best. Um, but, you know, perhaps just having some um, processes in place to make sure that that is, in fact, happening. You know, I don't think that's a bad idea either. Right. Okay. Now you're a mum, you're heavily involved in schools, PTA obviously. Uh, people are talking about gifted and talented programs, uh, you know, specialized high schools, etc. What is your view on those? I mean, some people say get rid of the gifted and talented programs, they promote segregation. You know, others say specialized high schools, you know, maybe we don't, we shouldn't have them. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on all, all of that? As a mum, as someone that's close sure. to in the school system? Sure. Um, as a mom, mm. I do think, number one, students learn differently. They learn at different levels. And the goal should be, how do we have each student achieve their best potential, right? So I think that maybe is getting lost in the conversation of all of this. And so my perspective on this is, how do we give students 
the most opportunity um, to be able to reach a higher goal, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't necessarily think the answer is taking away GNT or the SHSAT, because honestly, I think that's being used as a scapegoat. And I think what we need to focus on is how do we improve early childhood? And I think it's good that we're starting 3K, 4K, right? Giving students access to more after school programs, I think is also key. Um, and making sure even that some of the curriculum for the testing of SHSAT could be included in the Beacon programs or the DYCD funded after school programs, partnering with nonprofits to um, have these courses available. There's all different types of solutions oh. to give access to more people to be able to achieve better results. So I don't think it necessarily makes sense to take something away. In fact, I think we need to add more because I was asking um, someone, what's the cost of adding more GNT classes to these schools? Like, is there a cost? Is that the barrier? Like, what's the barrier, right? And that's actually not the barrier. It doesn't cost more to add GNT classes because um, this, the teachers, um, you know, it's not like an added cost for them to get extra certification or anything like that. So, so then my question becomes, okay, so why are there not more GNT classes in the elementary schools? And why do we not have it more accessible based on whoever qualifies, right, versus limiting or capping it per, per grade or per school? Um, and also, one thing I have to mention is that... Answer, Linda? Why aren't there more? That's what I want to find out because <laughs> I want oh, okay. like I I, I that's that was that was my question. Mm. So I that's as a parent, I'm just like, what's what's the hindrance or the barrier to having more of these, right? Yeah. I mean, and what's the incentive? So the teacher is a teacher. Why wouldn't you have more? Yeah. Mm. Right. And 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 in terms of the SHSAT, to be honest, I think one thing that bothers me about that whole conversation is that there's the model minority myth that is an assumption, right? So. The assumption is, oh, all, you know, there's a lot of Asians that are in these schools that are high performing, you know, they come from wealthy families, they're well resourced, they're privileged, they're all doctors, lawyers, and that's a model minority myth, I have to say, that we've been fighting as nonprofits across the board, because Asian Americans make up 15% of New York City's population and are the fastest growing, oh. but yet we only get about 1.2% of city funding towards helping our communities when it comes to direct social services. Mm. And I think what folks don't realize is that one four seniors live in poverty in the Asian community, right? And one in three um, high school seniors, either high school students either don't graduate on time or at all. Most of the folks that actually attend the high schools, um, specialized high schools are not from wealthy families. They qualify for the school lunches. They qualify for the free lunches before it was available to everybody. So, um, you know, these are a lot of myths that I think exist in the community. And so the thing that, um, you know, so, I, so I, I understand, listen, I'm all in favor of giving access to as many students as possible, no matter what part of the city you're in, no matter what skin color you are. And mm -hmm. I think that should be afforded to all students to be able to help them, um, you know, apply for these exams. But, you know, I, I think when it comes to the model minority myth, it actually hurts our communities a lot. And, and so the narrative, you know, I think has, has become, oh, well, why are there so many issues? Well, I think the question should be, why are we not giving more access to students to be able to, to do better? You know, like that should, like we need to improve the middle schools. We need to improve, you know, um, and making sure that folks have this access to the test and can get the prep that they need. Um, I've also had, you know, heard conversations and spoken to folks that, have access to, for example, foundations, right? Estee Lauder Foundation was willing to pour millions of dollars into helping um, different communities that don't have access to um, the test, whether it's because they can't afford it or because there's just none available in their neighborhoods. And so these are, I think, more creative solutions that we need to work on to um, be able to allow students to take that test successfully and, and get in there. Um, and also the other thing I would have to say is we need to improve high schools and middle schools and, you know, the public school system in general, because, you know, yes, it's great to go to a uh, specialized high school, but there's plenty of other schools in the city that are great as well, right? So how do we um, resource them up? Um, I think part of that actually is uh, salary parity for the teachers, right? I think we need to make sure that we pay teachers what they deserve and that we're keeping talent within the city and that they're not, we're not losing them to, um, you know, 
other parts of New York State. So I think that's also a part of it too, is let's, let's actually um, increase the salaries for the teachers and school administrators so that they're actually, um, in my opinion, you know, reflecting the work that they're putting into it. So that's another aspect of it as well. <laughs> mm, no, there's a lot of, all of these things have got so many tentacles, it's hard to really get right. to the bottom of it. Yeah. Um, all right, Linda, so tell me, is there anything else? I mean, you know, you, you've got a campaign going here, obviously, with many platforms and issues that you're running on. Are there things that you'd like to bring up just to, as we finish up? Sure. Um, I think one of the things I would want to mention is that, you know, I, I never thought I would want to run for a public office, but it's really in my nonprofit work where I really saw so clearly, wow, it's all about policies, right? Mm -hmm. So I can open my senior center or not, depends on whatever the city tells me. You know, like, and, and here's one example is that we have a Meals on Wheels program, right? Everyone knows that styrofoam is not great for the environment, mm -hmm. right? But, and then, so they banned styrofoam and they said to us nonprofit organizations, okay, you know, uh, you got to use microwavable containers, put the labels on it, it, here you go. And my question was, okay, so they cost more. <laughs> so are we going to get our contract funding increased to supplement that cost? And the answer is no, sorry, there's no more extra funding. You just got to figure it out, which is why we have to do all these crazy fundraising events and everything to supplement. But I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that we need to make sure that city government understands what actually works on the ground, what doesn't, what the challenges are, what the barriers are, because if we're asking um, community groups to provide a service, then I think we need to make sure that they have the resources they need to serve the community. Because we're the ones that are helping to keep people um, in their homes, keep them fed, um, to make sure that they're getting mental health and public health services that they need, right? And, and I think oftentimes the policies don't work on the ground. And that's what I realized very clearly during my time in the nonprofit sector is that policies, although they're well-intentioned and good, um, don't necessarily translate all the time <laughs> smoothly. Mm. And so for me, what really did it was, how do, we, how do we make sure that that community voice is also, there's, like there's a you know, top down, but there has to be a bottom up as well, right? So how do we make sure that that community voice is reflected in the policies that are coming out of, this, of City Hall? Um, and how do we make sure that we find solutions um, that make sense on the ground, um, that actually reflect and benefit the communities they're meant to serve? And so um, as someone who runs a multi-million dollar nonprofit that has in charge of 130 staff, roughly, it's growing, <laughs> but we have about 130 staff so far. And you know, when you're working on a shoestring budget, and when you're trying to comply with all the city regulations that are out there, and I go through, keep in mind, at least 20 audits minimally, minimally per year, right? Wow. So making sure that you're in compliance, you're doing what you need to do, you're following all the guidelines that the city gives you. I, like, I think for me, that's a unique perspective that I have compared to other folks that are running in this race. Because you know, there are folks that have served in government before, but it's very different being on the opposite receiving end where you're in charge of implementing all the policies that they're pushing out, right? And it's, it gives you a very different lens in terms of um, city government and city policy. And so I think that's something hopefully that will benefit the community. <laughs> no, absolutely. And being in charge of that many people too, uh, can't be easy. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And we serve folks from, you know, Long Island City all the way to the Little Neck, you know, uh, Long Island, Queens border. Um, we even serve folks that are out of state because they don't have any in-language services. So for mental health, we had someone from Texas calling in through telehealth because there are no mental health. So, so our, you know, the way I see, um, the way I would want city council and the way I view the city council seat is really similar in the sense of how I run my nonprofit, which is what are the community's needs? Um, how do we connect them to resources that they need? How do we help solve their issues? And how do we bring folks together? And so I think it's obviously on a much larger scale, but you know, I think that's really well, sort of I mean, the lens yeah, but, that- But mind you, a council office, I mean, what do they have? 10 people, eight people? So, I mean, you know, yeah. you imagine a hell of a lot more people than that. And, you know- yes. yeah. <laughs> 
And I mean, you know, the yeah. rubber meets the road when you're head of an organization as opposed to being one of 50. So, or what, 51. So, yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah, you're certainly in the thick of it now. Um, yeah. But, um, thanks, Linda, for your time. No, thank you so much, Christian. I really appreciate it. And I know that you're doing this across the borough and you have so many of these interviews. So I appreciate you taking time. Yeah, no, and it was really nice to meet you and best wishes on the 22nd. Thank you. Thank you so much.